Boa noite a todos. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to this conference uh, at the eighth uh, meeting of the Brazilian International Relations Association. Bem-vindos a todas e todos a esse, essa conferência do oitavo encontro da Associação Brasileira de oitavo encontro nacional da Associação Brasileira de Relações Internacionais. É, Chama-se Relações Internacionais e Ciência na Era das Pandemias. Olhares transdisciplinares sobre desafios globais. A conferência de... Meu nome é João Ponte Nogueira, da PUC do Rio de Janeiro. Eu vou mediar esse encontro hoje à noite. É, agradeço a presença de todos e todas. É, o nome da conferência de hoje é... Truth or post-truth, let's go credibility. Uh, eu tenho o grande prazer de uh, apresentar o professor Jeff Hoismans, da Queen Mary University of London, que será o nosso conferencista de hoje à noite. O professor Jeff Hoismans é professor de política internacional da Queen Mary University of London, professor titular. Uh, ele pesquisa, tem trabalhado em pesquisa e publicação, fundamentalmente nas áreas da política de segurança e insegurança, nas áreas, na área de securitização da migração, uh, no tema da primazia do movimento nas ciências sociais e no que a gente chama de pós-crítica nas relações internacionais e na sociologia política internacional. O professor Jeff Hoismans tem publicado extensamente tanto monografias quanto artigos em periódicos. Dentre os livros monográficos mais recentes que o professor Hoismans publicou, eu chamaria a atenção para The Politics of Insecurity, de 2006, e Security Unbound, de 2014. O professor Reutemann também é, editou alguns livros importantes na área de segurança crítica, estudos de segurança internacional é, de orientação crítica, entre eles, recentemente, Critical Security Methods, de 2014, com a professora Cláudia Aradal e outros. É, também, recentemente, com Xavier Guillaume, o livro editado Citizenship and Security, de 2013, e também um livro bastante conhecido aqui na, no, no Brasil, The Politics of Protection, de, 2000, de 2006, com Andrew Dobson e, e outros. Essas são, são algumas das publicações importantes do professor Reusman. Ele também publica regularmente e... e com grande frequência, em periódicos de ponta da nossa disciplina, como Security Dialogue, International Political Sociology, European Journal of International Studies, Millennium, além de outras publicações. O professor Reusmas também foi editor da revista International Political Sociology, da, da ISA, da International Studies Association, no período de 2012 a 2016. Ele também faz parte do conselho editorial de várias revistas de ponta da nossa área. E é um, eu diria que é um dos acadêmicos da geração dele de maior proeminência. Ele é, hoje também faz parte, coordena a área de, de sociologia política internacional da Associação Europeia de Relações Internacionais, a EISA. So after this uh, brief presentation of Professor Hoismans. I think we can begin uh, his conference on post-truth, truth and post-truth. Uh, and uh, I, uh, Professor Hoismans will speak for about 30, 40 minutes, and then we will open for questions from the audience. A gente vai abrir para perguntas do público. These questions of OPG, uh, que apresentem as perguntas por escrito via chat. Dessa maneira, a, 
o período de perguntas e respostas vai fluir mais de maneira mais ágil, mais mais rápida, para que todo mundo tenha oportunidade de apresentar suas perguntas. Então, quero agradecer a Abre pela oportunidade de estar mediando esse, essa conferência no seu oitavo encontro nacional, em particular a professora Carolina Mulan, que estendeu esse convite gentilmente. So, uh, without further ado, I will uh, give the floor to Jeff Hoitzmans. Thanks, Joao. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for the invitation to speak to you, although it's very late here. It's almost midnight. Are we approaching midnight? But I'm glad to be at the conference at the, and to do the talk here. Uh, it's my first time at the ABRI conference. Uh, so I'm going to talk about truth and post-truth. Let's go credibility, which is, but before I start, I want to say that I draw on work here that I've done with Claudia Arado. So it's a joint, it's work we did a while back, uh, but keeps us and keeps us busy on reflecting on critical approaches on methods and validation of knowledge and critical security studies. In that context, we at some point had to engage with the question of truth and post-truth, or more broadly about the conditions of and the interpretation of how you validate knowledge. And so the question of post-truth is a huge question to some extent. In one sense, it's a very simple one. It's, you know, it's about truth and how do you actually establish truth. But more broadly, it is actually a big question where all kinds of contentions are at play. You can approach it in relation to the role of social media. You can approach it from a geopolitical side as became very present about uh, meddling into elections and so on by international actors. You can look at methods of knowledge production, how methods of knowledge production have changed through, for example, the availability of big data analytics. You have discussions around the rise of populist in, in, big, in several parts of the work, specifically about the far right and the right and how they actually just don't take care, don't bother about truth, but do other politics. You know, in the context where I sit here, it's one speaks about cultural wars and so on, as in the US. You can also think about it, how there are changes in the media landscape taking place. There are discussions about how, as I already referred to, how social media is challenging, who has authority to make news and so on. And post roots debates all tack into that. There is an element about uh, the contentions around, you know, what is expertise and what is an expert and who counts as an expert, and whether experts are actually present in politics. So it's actually quite a broad area through which, and so it, I always think that you then need an entry point into it. And the point Claudia and I took uh, for entering this was a very academic one, because we were interested in, you know, what it meant to do methodology and methods critically. And so we were interested in the more academic challenges that were running through the discussion around post-truth. And one of them that was actually both of us coming from kind of what you would see the bad guys, the guys who were seen to be, you know, relativizing truth, the ones who were interested in sociologies of knowledge productions, the ones who were interested in deconstruction and post structural lines of thought, where truth became a historical achievement or a social or a political achievement rather than an epistemologically grounded something. And so in academia, when post-truth emerged, there was a debate that started going on where people said, you know, you see all the people who talked about truth being relative, uh, knowledge being relative, uh, interested in, you know, the social production of knowledge, the social conditions of knowledge. And they're not only the post-structuralists, if you do histories of science, I mean, you know, you can go back to the paradigm debates around Kuhn, which were also about you know, how science and knowledge and what counts as serious knowledge statements and scientific statements are actually socially, historically and politically conditioned rather than just epistemologically grounded in. And so we came into that and we said, you know, there is something, there is a challenge being posed where the question became that there was an attempt by some to say, we need to revisit the grounding of truth claims. So we can actually say when truths, which then also slips in facts, what is factual knowledge, what is truthful knowledge, and what is not truthful knowledge. And we ground the authority of science back into truth. 
and also of social sciences. And of course, I think I'm a bit wary about actually grounding knowledge into truth in that particular sense. Uh, because it of course comes, it's not a neutral statement to make, to ground knowledge into truth. You don't say much, but often it then leads, specifically if it moves from post-truth, comes connected to post-fact or give us our facts back, as uh, Norcio Maris has in a provocative title uh, on these debates, you know, that it actually reintroduces what's called the correspondence theory of knowledge back in, where you actually assume there's some external reference points out there against which you cannot, you can actually establish knowledge. There is an element about also a methodological concern. You know, the whole debate becomes how do you establish this methodologically? And so you can grant knowledge in some reference. But we know that that, that is a whole debate about, and this where there is a very contentious correspondence theory of knowledge is contentions. Uh, but it also doesn't really get to uh, some of the stakes that are present in post-truth, and specifically, you know, this correspondence theory of knowledge has been heavily challenged uh, by other kind of epistemologies. And we were worried about what a move like this uh, would do within the scientific field, because of course this has to do, as I'll come back to, with who has the authority to speak, what kind of statements can you make that are seen as credible, for example, international politics, international political science statements, and which are not seen as credible. Yeah? And what kind of methods and methodologies are favored when you actually try to ground uh, issues in a truth and access to a truth based on correspondence theories of knowledge. And of course, there is a with the trajectory from where I come from and several in the fields I work come from, this is, of course, uh, a controversial issue because a lot of experimenting and interesting work has emerged within international relations precisely because people let go of this and started experimenting with more with creative methods and so on became more creative around methodology became more creative on what counted as knowledge and not as a serious knowledge and so we got a lot of insights in my area in how security is constituted and so the variety of security claims that are made the challenges to more classical geopolitical thinking around security and so on and so letting that go because there is a concern about you know or a broader political concern around post-truth uh, by then re-establishing this specific entry point into claiming truth and giving authority to specific ways of doing uh, international political science in, in our case, but more generally in doing science, uh, was a bit um, a kind of thing that I think we shouldn't give in to too quickly. The other thing is that the truth claim in post-truth is not only about these kinds of epistemological methodological debates, debates within the scientific field, uh, but also that truth often is a ground for making universalistic claims, yeah? a view that there is ultimately only one truth and one world. And so this actually would be, this challenges seriously, the intellectual lineages that have existed, that historicized, sociologized and culturalized knowledge and truth. This idea that there is actually not just one form of doing knowledge and so on. If you look and study how knowledge is done in different places, different communities, different times, and so on. So there is an element about, and there is, I personally, I can say this, I'm quite wary, wary about actually claiming when truth claims to become and take on a universalistic dimension about there will be one truth, because they often end up in quite dogmatic, polarizing statements. Uh, and these are actually quite worrying and therefore tack onto what is can be seen as a resurgence of you know grand narratives and ideological politics and moves also concerns i mean post truth is also concerned with democratic politics of course and i think actually it, it might lead to anti-democratic conceptions of knowledge production and so on so there is a broader concern where this this issue with truth and therefore the question became let's look at how do we approach and try to understand how knowledge is validated. And of course, epistemological claims are part of this and truth claims. But what we want to propose is that there is a, to introduce a conceptual device, if you can call it like that, or a concept that allows us 
to, to approach the question and the issues of debate that are at stake and in debate in the, in, in the post-truth, post-fact discussion in a slightly different way. And we call this uh, concept that we introduced assembling credibility. And it's a drawing hybridly on uh, understandings of science from as a credit economy, yeah, as a further validation, which I'll come back in a second, as well as then the idea that this is a very decentralized way uh, of assembling uh, authority and credibility uh, within scientific, within science as well, social science, natural sciences, and so on. And so I'll talk us through these two bits. So first credibility, then assembling. Yeah, and it is therefore an argument that is built to tackle and to move us away from this debate about, you know, the stakes in relativism on the one hand and the other the related idea that if you, if you have these kinds of more sociological approaches to knowledge or the more deconstructive approaches to science, the more experimental approaches uh, to methods and so on, that you actually reproduce a relativist form of knowledge in which knowledge in which might and power becomes knowledge. So it's always this idea that you just struggle and fight over. And if you impose long enough and repeat the stuff long enough, you will actually get the knowledge uh, accepted. And so it is works against these. And so let me start therefore with the credit model uh, of knowledge. And rather than using truth is how knowledge is validated you don't start from epistemological debates about you know, paradigms, about falsification and so on, but you start approaching scientific knowledge and exchanges that take place in, in, in terms of credits. So rewards that one gets. And knowledge, the value of knowledge depends to a considerable extent on credits that scientists, academics, scholars, experts gather uh, in the form of awards high citations, you know all of this, international invitations, and so on, yeah? Sometimes also producing certain kinds of knowledges, yeah? And these do not just translate in material rewards like higher pay or tenure and so on, but also in symbolic capital and credentials. So in which it becomes a measure for the recognition by other scientists about the value value not just financially and in capital terms, but more generally in terms of uh, credentials and so that one has, that, you know, that one gathers. And so the validation, the knowledge validation, therefore becomes, rather than studying the truth claims, you have to take into account that this is a much, that is equally important to start looking at the acquisition, circulation, and distribution of certain credits. What are these credits? How are they circulate? Do they circulate internationally? Are there differences in national circulations or particular institutional circulations of credits compared to others? And the acquisition, who acquires this? And, and how are they acquired? The distribution of the credits and so on. So that is actually quite important because then science, <coughs> the scientific field and where knowledge production is done and the credibility of that knowledge becomes structured around in the first instance an internal dynamic, a dynamic that is quite specific for scientific communities, if you want to. And in Bourdieu's term, I, will, I prefer to speak about fields and I'll explain why in a second. So into a scientific field. And the scientific field is characterized not just by its different epistemological kind of positions it has, but also very importantly, about the distributions. It's structured to the distributions of specific kind of capitals uh, that are there. And that is uh, important because as I said, this, it, if you just would say the whole stake is about truth, yeah, you will actually miss out about how the what counts as truth or counts as a fact is actually partly socially, politically, but institutionally also conditioned by the way the field is structured. And that field is not necessarily universal. That might differ in the structuration, uh, depending on places, depending on times, and so on. That is there. And now we think that is a better way of starting to approach and open up the discussions around post-truth within the academic community. Is something happening there about the credentials, the credits 
that they acquire and how they're distributed and circulated. And so you get a better grip on how in the post truth debate, there are particular kinds of power relations at play within the academic field itself. In this case, if we understand the scientific field as academically as, as taking place among academics. Now, that notion of the scientific field <clears throat> and the credit economy, therefore is an opening that is made. And of course, there is an element about, as I said, so far I've spoken about science as a particular kind of bounded field, right? Within which these credits circulate. Uh, we can all have stories about, you know, what counts as credits, how credit has changed. If you've been long in the profession, relatively long, like me, you can see how certain elements about how you gather credit, how they're slightly changing and so on. Uh, and, and so what does that mean? And how do you deal with that? How are my younger colleagues who start now a PhD? What are they doing, which is different from what I did and so on. And, and so you can study this, but it's within the scientific field, if you want to, uh, that is taking place. So it's a bounded entity within. Yeah. And so that's also one of the stakes then to which we'll come back maybe later on is about, you know, how the autonomy of that field is established, but rather there is a stake in here in some people say we need to do truth to actually keep our field as a distinct form of knowledge production with a distinct authority and that is a historical achievement that science taught itself of as an autonomous field a field that is different from the political field that is different from the economic field and so on but rather than go there we can pick that up the question of autonomy later on if you want to i would I wanted actually to move into something else, which is that of the second part of the debate, the, or another part of the debate that's going on, which is that these fields, the academic field, how credit is on, is of course not really bounded. It's much more porous than we think, in the sense that it sits much more strongly in a broader set of norms and societal developments. Yeah? So it's not like set out by itself. In Bourdieu's in term of the field, you study this about, you know, that people transfer in and out, for example, you know, how you can get credits by working in the private industry and then come back to an engineering department or so, or you work in private law and therefore you have an authority, an extra authority within or not within uh, the legal profession, uh, or you work for an international organizations and then you come back or you stay at the same time with one foot in each an academic field. So he keeps on doing that. In that way, but in some way that is that it's important. And here I'm going to come to the notion of not just credibility instead of truth. So credibility as a credit economy, but the notion of rather than thinking about different fields of practice and see how there is transfer between them, yeah, to start thinking in a looser way about how the validation of knowledge is embedded within societies and certain times. Uh, or histories, if you want to. And that's where the notion of assembling will come in, which is a more decentralized, multiple, heterogeneous, a bit more chaotic, if you want, the way in which things connect up to give authority and seriousness to certain forms of claim making or certain bodies uh, of knowledge and discourse that are there. And so I'm going to start, I'm going to refer here very briefly to, 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 to illustrate what that means, how it's more open to a quite famous work by someone called, by Chopin, who actually studied how in the 17th century, it was discussion about the discussion about what counted as scientific knowledge as a debate between the experimental scientists, Boyle, who did experiments, yeah, and Hobbes, who is a much more philosophical kind of form of knowledge uh, based on natural philosophy and so on, of how that actually can be. And he said, you know, when you look at how Boyle established it, while Hobbes's form of thinking is very much about the philosopher, academic, the intellectual that sits there, Boyle was an experimental one. And one of the elements of what made that knowledge, that to gain credibility to that knowledge, you had actually to show your experiments to other gentlemen. Yeah? That was a key port, part of conveying credibility. On it. So you had to publicly show your experiment so the others could see that it worked, but the others were not everyone, they were gentlemen. This we talk about the 17th century. Yeah. So it had to be a public space with witnesses by gentlemen yeah, as an obligatory move uh, to gain credibility in experimental and probabilistic knowledge. 
Uh, and so that was therefore underwritten, knowledge became underwritten by a set of conventions that were at the same time being played out across society, uh, which had to do, you can already see the gender dimension of this, but also the class dimension, only particular people counted as gentlemen who could come in. But there is also an element about the publicness of knowledge and the demonstration of knowledge, which was very different from the, from the philosopher's form of knowledge uh, that, that, that Hobbes actually produced. And why I use this, why we use this example is actually to say that, you know, there is some homology, there's a considerable homology to how uh, knowledge claims and bodies of knowledge are validated and contested, right? And, and, and how, valid, how, the, how knowledge becomes the conditions of the validation of knowledge and the differences between these that take place, yeah? That these are actually set into and are not cut off from a whole set of societal developments, norms, conventions, and so on that are at play. And therefore, you, in some sense, cannot fully understand scientific knowledge and its validation by just having it in the credit circulation within the field. This is not just the credits as tangible things that circulate, but there is actually some kind of element that works across. And you can, therefore, what it opens up as a question is, you can start seeing what is at stake in claiming validity for particular kinds of scientific knowledge or particular criteria which create credibility uh, of knowledge. And I can give you two examples of this, of how this circulation works and, and transformations. They, they are in some way, what shall I say, banal examples because they come from a much more narrower thing than the big debates around Boyle and Hobbes, the discussion around the invention of experimental and probabilistic science compared to the philosophical science of grounding into, into philosophical foundations. But I still think it illustrates uh, what is meant by this embedding, the embeddedness of uh, knowledge within a broader set of criteria, conventions, contentions, and also political processes that are taking place. Because of course the Boyle element about experimenting and open to the gentleman is then also read backwards as an opening a reflection in science of debates around you know, the incipient debates around particular forms of modern democracy uh, that emerged that were actually present and reflected in having to publicly demonstrate and argue for your science in, in a way through demonstration rather than just argumentation. But the example I'm taking is, I don't know, maybe some of you are not familiar, maybe some of you are, is an argument, you know, in, in, I take it from critical security studies, but it's a bit more broader, an interest in, a renewed interest in the materiality of things. Uh, so from the side of security studies where I come from and where I work in, you know, critical security studies for a, long, for a while in the last 20 years, spoke a lot about language, discourse, the importance of heuristics, hermeneutics, and so on that was being at play. And as a, as a reaction now to it, one says, we have forgotten about the material which is a particular reading, of course, of that history. But so we need to take into account again how certain technologies by themselves do things and so on. So you have a material element that comes. I can say, so we cannot just work on language, discourse, and so on. But we need actually to start focusing on materiality of things. It's not the same as the realist approaches in IR, which are about material interests and so on. This is really about focusing on, you know, if you want to understand border controls, you have to look at the specific technologies. Who do they bring in relation to whom? Uh, the algorithmic devices that are being at play and what do they do and so on. And so we bring all this together in that. But what's interesting is that if you read a bit broader what's happening uh, around issues, you can also, for example, if you look at uh, asylum applications and so on, you start seeing developments there as well, or you look at war crimes, how war crimes are established. You see working a, a similar developments towards an interest in, uh, uh, an, in, an increasing validation, not, not increasing, but a setting of contentious issues around forensic evidencing uh, versus relying on witnesses, testimony, interviews, people's memories, about things, right? So 
you see these elements coming in that sometimes one will ask for physical, uh, for example, in asylum applications, the, the value of physical traces of torture, for example, need sometimes to be present. Or in war crimes where you actually start actually working on the material, material traces and reconstruct uh, the violences that took place by looking at the bullet traces, the collapsing of buildings, and so on, as forensic, as the, you might have heard about this, but if not, the big project by Weissman around uh, forensic architectures that is taking place. And you see all these bits. At the same time, in popular culture, you the crime series were heavily forensic, sophisticated so forensics with high technology and so on. So in some way, there is something happening in society around this. And the issue is not truth, right? When I ask my students to write about, forensics versus witnessing or testimony, they often, they often in the beginning start saying forensics well, because it's material things, you know, you have no subjective presence of it. But of course, there is all kinds of debates going on. But there are stakes in this, because the stakes are really, so it is not just the stake is not truth only, the stake is also the validity of testimony and witness statements, for example, and the devaluation of testimony, relative devaluation of testimony and witness. And what does that do? to, for example, uh, research on our cases around crime and so on, but also to the research that we do and the methods that you use and so on in scientific fields. So you can start seeing some social, political, sometimes highly sensitive stakes that are at play, uh, specifically in relation to, for example, atrocities that are committed and so on. So just to illustrate that there is this kind of sense border thing. And so Norsetina speaks therefore in a way about that we should actually study much more about how validity is assembled through all these little bits of developments that are happening, the circulations that are taking place and so on, but also the homologies that are taking place in different areas of practices where you can see similar structural developments, although they have different functions, for example, uh, within it. And that opens up the question a bit from focusing on, which is partly the focus in post to be, it's about the boundary between, so we want to have scientists and that we have other people, other knowledges, lay knowledges and so on. This, and then and it leads to trying to draw a sharp boundary between these two very often, that you relax these and see actually, you know, how knowledge is conditioned and generated the conditions of the validation are generated in a much broader multiple element, which is much less easy to fix by saying, okay, this is a criterion and that's not a criterion. It's also actually more fluid and multiple and dispersed, if you want to, than what the credit model of science that I, spoke, I started from around field actually uh, referred to. And I think so that this one opens up and why is that important? That is important in the post-truth debates, in my opinion, because it takes us away from a focus on truth to actually try to come to an understanding. What is, what are the particular kind of, what is that uh, notion of contentions and stakes that are played out under the rubric truth and post-truth, which are not always about just about, they're about, of course, there are epistemological arguments that play around truth, but they're not just about truth. They are societal. It allows us to, rather than, go back and say, oh, we need stricter methods. We need stricter uh, disciplining of the knowledges that are produced because that's where the credibility in society will come from. This might be exactly the wrong way because there are developments happening in society that actually that, that are feeding back into how knowledge gets validated and how things are changing. And this model of the assembling, the more trans, I mean, she speaks about trans, Knorsetina speaks about trans epistemic arenas, but it's this more decentralized structuring makes us, allows us to see these issues, which I think are the real issues that are at stake rather than truth in the post-truth uh, debates. And so it allows us to understand that. And that actually also, I think, might take us a bit away from the epistemologically focused debates on realism versus relativism. Uh, that truth requires realism. If you relativize truth, you do relativism and therefore everything becomes possible. This assembling of credibility, it's not because it's decentralized and dispersed that it is more easy to change. It's highly structured in some sense. It might sound awkwardly, but it has structured contentions. It shifts and changes 
but it is not like an open thing. You can make any statement uh, or you can do any kind of activity within it. There's all kinds of issues at play. So it is not an open, despite it's very dispersed and, 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 and multiple dimensions to it. Having said that, one of, let me now very briefly in the last few minutes I have also add one more dimension to this. So I spoke about moving from true to credit and credibility, then moving away from this, not moving away, but actually trying to think uh, not just in terms of field and the boundedness and the autonomy of the scientific field, but trying to see through the notion of assembling credibility, how it is much more broadly decentered and embedded in a set of societal contentions, developments that are played out across several arenas in society. Uh, and that this is a multiple field. And that this is important to get us into the various contentions that are at play and the various development to broader societal, political, and economic developments that are being that are at play. And how this actually intervenes in the debate about relativism versus realism. But there is one other bit that is often leads to this idea that you know post-truth means in the end it means not everything goes, but knowledge is not power, but power is knowledge in the sense that might decides what actually wins. And there is an understanding, you know, as if post-truth comes into being, as if science and knowledge across the science, scientific knowledge and knowledge validation is really a war. It's in the end a fight between different positions. And the ones who fight hardest and are most successful in institutionalization, they win, you know, and that's the model of credible science that we have. And so there is currently a war going on around this, uh, which is not just a war within scientific field, but a war, you know, where one actually questions this. But there is an element where one actually should start questioning whether this is indeed what's happening. If we take assembling credibility, it's not really a war. There's all kinds of contentions, disputes. We know these. I'm sure we would have some, if you would be in the same room, you have some contentions and so on, but I would not characterize that as a war in the sense. But neither is it so that if I bring an, if you bring an army of other colleagues, that you necessarily, by just being there and repeating it, that you win the element and therefore can start imposing a new orthodoxy or whatever about what science is or the same on my side. That is because it's not a binary dichotomous kind of contention element. The assembling element is decentralized and the multiple thing, and it's so embedded within broader social, economic, and other developments that are taking place. You actually, it is much more fruitful to actually move away from this idea that it's about a fight, it's about a war. No, there are multiple contentions, there are multiple compromises. There are, of course, uh, some nasty things happening too, but it actually has much more micro elements and it's a tie together of the micro bits, the micro disputes, the micro contentions and so on that are taking place, yeah, through which various models, various validations of knowledge take hold, develop and exist. And therefore it is much more, a, rather than a war, which is a clash between opposites, where one tries to actually subdue the other one, there is a more a sense also about a reciprocal development around dependencies between various arenas, for example, and various knowledges in its validation. And that, I think, is a third component that is broad, that is central to the credibility, assembling credibility, that in terms of, you know, the being readiness to believe something is true or not, is not about a war over orthodoxies and dogmas. It really is a much more decentralized, element that have works to all kinds of dependencies and reciprocal accomplishments that take place. And therefore you work with disputes, contentions and so on, rather than a big war that's at play. And I think that is important insofar you're concerned about the post-truth debates being partly also about, you know, the revival of cultural wars, if you're interested or some of my colleagues uh, in Queen Mary's study, uh, the rise of the, of, of the far right globally and so on. But there are other elements we can pick up political discussions uh, a bit down the line. But so assembling credible, let me conclude now because my time is up. Uh, simply what we tried, Claudia and I have tried to do in the context of critical security studies, but what I try to translate into this talk is then if we engage with the truth and post-truth debates 
Uh, it makes sense not to focus in the first instance about truth and within academic debates, whether it's an international policy, international relations about these debates around, you know, we need a new truth and we need to go back to correspondent analysis or we need actually to go back to a, a claim for the universality of criteria around which knowledge can be built and so on. And we have universal knowledges that are there, but actually to move and enter them as well through discussions, uh, through the concept of trying to see it as an assembling of credibility, which borrows this idea that part of validation knowledge is a certain circulation of credits and an acquiring of credits that you get in within a field, but actually with the assembling to not just focus on a scientific field as bounded and as autonomous by itself, but also as relatively porous and embedded in society. So you don't also have, you get rid of this idea that science has a purity to it, it has a distinctness to it, but the idea that science has a purity to it, that is polluted if it gets too embedded in society, uh, which sometimes comes with claiming authority over uh, or in the name of truth. And I think that's important because truth, because it makes us more sensitive to what are the various contentions and developments that are taking place. And that we cannot just say, okay, let's give an epistemological solution to the problem by reaffirming uh, the possibility of a truth, one truth that we can establish to rigorous methodology and particular kind of doing science within it. And so, because that would leave the focus on knowledge rather than on how these debates are around knowledge and validation are embedded in actually quite complex processes that are taking place nationally, regionally, globally, in various ways. Uh, and so that's the case we make for looking at this debate from a, using, from a concept of assembling credibility rather than truth versus post-truth. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff. Um, it's really a lot of uh, provocative questions here uh, that we can raise around the issue of post-truth. Um, I'm sure that will be a, a very dynamic debate around this. Uh, so, uh, after thanking Jeff, I would like to invite everyone who is in the, with us in the Zoom meeting and in the YouTube uh, meeting as well to send us their questions, observations, comments uh, via uh, chat, please. Okay, uh, so before uh, we listen to your uh, questions and comments, um, I would like to raise a couple of issues with Jeff, if I may. Uh, already apologizing, perhaps, if I'm going to put questions that you've uh, that you've uh, already dealt with in your in your talk. But maybe we can go a bit uh, further in uh, some of the issues. I think the first the first question I would, uh, or at least issue I would raise, Jeff, is that the question of I know that you're not speaking really about truth regimes, you're speaking more about credibility, credence, authority, uh, academic fields and so forth, science. Uh, but of course, these days, in the past few years, the question of truth has come back again, right? In public debates and scientific debates and so on. Uh, and this is not a new, question. I mean, the problem of truth has been around for a very long, long time. Uh, not at least since the Greeks and philosophy, right? Uh, so we don't need to go around that anymore. Uh, but surely uh, the status of truth has been under attack at least since, I don't know, Marx, Freud, Nietzsche, if you like. The, uh, these three big uh, authors who are known as uh, the ones who uh, engage with truths from the point of view of suspicion, right? Truth is always either, you know, some kind of uh, lie in the case of Marxism, ideology or, you know, alienation and so forth. In the case of Freud, uh, often truth is hidden by suppressed uh, desires, suppressed contents in the unconscious. And for Nietzsche, truth is mostly an expression of power relations. So it's uh, 
It's just about different regimes of truth. So it would seem, right, Jeff, that the issue of truth was more or less done with by the end of the 20th century, right? I mean, no one's really raising the problem of truth anymore. But just how truth becomes, certain truth regimes become established in certain social fields, scientific fields, in uh, political institutions, uh, in international relations, the issue of truth obviously is the uh, approach through the uh, problem of uh, rules, regimes, knowledge, epistemic communities and so forth, but there's really no real claim on truth anymore. So my question is, and the first question I would make is why, why has this come up again? And how is it different this time? How does this problem of truth and post-truth in the case, which is actually another way of having some kind of nostalgia, right? About the times we have certainties about things, democracy, you know, ideology, economics, equality, and so forth. And suddenly, you know, there's a new discomfort with the way these provisional truths are established or consensuses, if you like, right? There is a breakup of uh, the more institutional, the more accepted ways of establishing some kind of consensus around certain things. So how, how would you see this coming about again with such force? Uh, and of course you raise in your, in your article with Claudia some, uh, some instances, right? Some phenomena in contemporary IR and contemporary politics that may point perhaps to how these things come about. So you talk about the debate on climate science, global warming and so forth, and how it has become a debate about the validity of climate science at some point and then afterwards about negationism, uh, uh, the reluctance to accept facts about global warming, uh, but it's still a debate around truth, the truth of climate science. Uh, you also mentioned Trumpism and uh, the way you know, the, the many medias that uh, Trumpist movements have utilized to disseminate news, to disseminate opinions, to discredit uh, the deep state to discredit uh, mainstream uh, institutions, media, organizations, and so forth. How these, um, the, this new phenomena perhaps raised again the problem of uh, perhaps a breakdown in the credibility mechanisms accepted by most people to establish facts, to establish uh, uh, groundwork, or how the Americans like to say, you know, a, a playing field where you can discuss things, you can more or less accept the terms of a debate around, you know, the, the main issues in our, in our times. So Trumpism is, is of course an important issue. Of course, there's been many other moments of demagoguery in our history, uh, you know, to speak only of our recent history where propaganda, ideology, populism, all these things were there for a long time. So perhaps there is some, some light you could help us eliminate uh, how, you know, this new wave, if you like, of uh, attacks on truth, on the truth regimes of modernity, if you like, or democracy and the modern state, how these mechanisms are more efficiently being discredited in a way that these days you have a lot of people in the United States, I think more than a third of the population that believes Trump won the election. They still believe that, right? Uh, so maybe there's a difference in scale here or the reach of these mechanisms where people question the results of the election, but question it, you know, in a more effective way, you know, in a way that, that really has repercussions in many other spheres of society, not just the usual 
complaints about the election results, uh, and also how people can effectively contest facts that have been recorded extensively, like the invasion of the Capitol, right? And uh, the significance of that invasion, the meaning of that invasion. Uh, so that's been, was reported live, right? Uh, it's been discussed through an extensive impeachment process in Congress. Many experts, uh, a lot of forensic, forensic, if you like, of media to analyze what went on. And still, it's been contested. That thing, not that it happened, but that it was carried out, for instance, by Trump supporters. So that's still being effectively contested. And then, of course, the other example is the pandemic, where, I, where you also have very efficient mechanisms to contest the validity of, of vaccines, uh, the promotion of a certain medicines as treatments that have no scientific support. That's very present here in Brazil. And a lot of people have adhered to that kind of uh, 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 information about the validity of certain of chloroquine and so forth. Uh, the effectiveness of uh, isolation, you know, lockdowns, uh, restrictions on mobility, um, the origins of the virus. So there's all kinds of things that are in the pandemic that seem to have uh, also fueled these, uh, the debate between truth and post-truth in a way that, as you mentioned, right, it sounds like or it seems like this war model in play, mm -hmm. right, between scientific experts, scientists, the World Health Organization, you know, pharmaceutical industries, uh, a, a, a network or, you know, a field of actors that try to say well, science, you know, is where the truth lies. And all these people's people talking about questioning that science or negationists are, you know, uh, crazies or they're, you know, uh, negationists and so forth. So this this is a really, at least that's what it feels like here, a war model between two camps defending very polarized positions. So how, how would you would you say that there's been you know, an evolution since 2016, for instance, when these issues began to be raised by by the election of Trump, and and now right, has the war model become more pervasive? Is that something we can talk about in the context of the pandemic, or we still need to look at uh, the many microstructures at play that have, are producing this effect, right? In uh, in policies like uh, in Brazil, like in the United States, and well, in the United States, you know, more than thirty percent of the population doesn't want to get the vaccine. So it seems that the the politics of post truth perhaps has evolved to a level where it's become more generalized perhaps uh, these days. So that's that's one issue that, that comes to mind. And one last issue, I think, which is interesting also to discuss is whether we can talk or think about um, the uh, what you've talked about, the credibility and credence Right and credulity, the, all these ways of validating knowledge, um, in both in academic fields and scientific fields, which is mostly what you were concerned about, and non-scientific, non-academic fields. So, first, uh, in the context of the pandemic, have these boundaries become more blurred? They usually do, right? Become more blurred. And is there a way where we can deploy the you know, the forensics of credibility, of assembly credibility to deal with these big issues in public debate. 
uh, not just within you know uh, the academic field and how 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 would this translate to a broader uh, to broader debates uh, around policy for instance right and um, and uh, how how do you see these boundaries moving today between academic and non-academic fields right in in public health it really would seem that you have many other fields you know politics party politics culture you know, all kinds of different fields invading public health discussions and and questioning the truth and the credibility of of public health globally really <clears throat> Uh, so that's uh, that's something that's been going on now. So do you think you know that will destabilize or undermine again the different regimes through through which public health is established as a uh, credible science uh, globally? And uh, if you see a fragmenting of this field in the future, I knew I'm inviting you to speculate. So it's just. Uh, to make things more fun, I guess, for us here in the debate. So these are just some issues that come to mind, right? Well, there would be there would be more, and uh, I believe we also have questions from the public. Hang on. So. Okay, we have a question from uh, Carolina Moulin via YouTube. I'm going to translate. I'm going to read in Portuguese first and then translate, Jeff, ok? Yeah. Então, a primeira pergunta da, da professora Carolina é, Jeff, como essa materialidade que você menciona, em particular, essas assemblagens de tecnologia e data e dados, afeta a questão da autoria e, por conseguinte, da responsabilidade política? So, translating, Jeff, Carolina asks, Jeff, how does this materiality uh, you mentioned, in particular assemblages of technology and data, affects the question of authorship and, uh, and as a consequence of political responsibility? That's the first question about political responsibility. The second question by Paulo Roberto Ferreira Tivelato via YouTube. Obrigado pela palestra. Me pergunto o que restaria como elemento unificador da ciência moderna sem a utopia da autonomia e autoridade sobre verdades universais. Talvez horizontes como de saberes localizados propostos por Donna Haraway. Thank you for the talk. Uh, I asked myself what would be left as a unifying element of modern science without this utopia of autonomy authority over universal truths. Perhaps uh, uh, certain horizons have, as such as situated knowledges proposed by Donna Haraway, localized knowledges, for instance, would that be uh, something that would be left instead of universal truth about science? So these are the two questions I have. Uh, so I think we can uh, give the floor back to Jeff after all these questions. Thank you. Yeah. As per usual, I get a very difficult questions. Next time I do a talk about security and then actually it will be easier <laughs> to reply. These are very big questions, uh, both from Joao, Carolina, and I missed the last person because I can't see it on the, I, I, have, I don't have YouTube open. Uh, I'm not sure I have an answer to all of them. And Joao, if there are new questions, tell me and stop. Maybe I can start with the last two and then come some of you, yours. Uh, although I don't think I'll speculate uh, on public health and what's going to happen there. But let me see. Uh, Carolina, about authorship. So when you assemble and how does authorship and responsibility come? I think there's a similar invitation when you actually work with this more decentralized, decentering understanding of uh, how knowledge becomes connected through small to some teams here, some teams there. You know, let's say in surveillance, for example, how one actually tries then to locate responsibility 
in particular people who write algorith algorithms, for example. But we know that they are very dispersed processes and they work on small things. They also borrow from other kinds of elements. There is an element about, do we really want to actually make the political question of responsibility to be one that is identified with a particular person? Or is there an element that is debates around this, whether we should actually much more work about, you know, what are criteria of care that is taken within the scientific community or within developing knowledge that is taking place? And that is not, uh, you know, it's not an element about responsibility, which leads into questions of justice and judging at that point, but more about actually understanding the processes through which this goes and how you invest uh, procedures of care, for example, into that. Uh, you might be familiar with that. There are debates going on in, I mean, debates. There are reflections about this in the context of, uh, of these kind of materialistic, this assembling approaches that are taking place. Another element that I think is this, whether there is, uh, in my reply, would be something to reflect about, whether it's the question of responsibility that is key, that is the key we want to go to, which is a question that in the end, we want to make a judgment when something goes wrong or goes right, right? And you celebrate some person or some group of people, and then you condemn some other ones. It's a very judicial kind of judgmental kind of approach to it. And someone else, someone like Norge Maras, for example, has written about post fact quite a bit. Uh, also in line of this thinking around assembling, she comes up in her, in, in her, she comes up for an argument that really what we should be looking at is not, she doesn't say not necessarily responsibility, but she makes an argument that we need to recover from that one, an element of processual character of public knowledge, of how knowledge claims are being made in public, but how these claims are always in formation. So you have an element where contestation and contention around knowledge becomes an integral element uh, of the politics of knowledge. And that is what we look at because you want to grapple with uh, what is the contentious issue around which mobilizations in the name of a truth or a non-truth, a fact or a non-fact are taking place. And she uses for the example, I mean, it's an example from the UK, but she has other examples as well. It's in the debates here around the UK leaving the European Union, there was an argument made about that leaving the EU would actually free up so many millions and millions of money, billions that could go into the National Health Service, for example. And of course, there has been a lot of debate about that this was a lie. This was not a fact, right? And by focusing on the lie, you can have these debates. But the argument, if you start looking at it, what you lose from this is how comes people more, you could mobilize around the claim about needing more money for the National Health Service. So that the issue at stake becomes that. And then it's not necessarily just an argument about responsibility, but this is an argument where you retain and tease out the sense. So it is really about what in the politics of, not, of truth, post-truth, fact, post-fact, uh, how do you want to approach it? Is it a question of responsibility? Is it a question of you know, the criteria of care that have taken place or other kind of criteria of, that are embedded within these processes? Or is it element, and or is it elements about you know, keeping attention on what kind of, rather than the truth element is, what kind of contentions? How comes people mobilize around this? What's going on? Uh, what is the contentious issue? the public contentious issue around which this is, which might not be an issue just about truth, whether it's fact or not, might not matter. Uh, and so we should pay attention to that. So there are different approaches to this. On the other question about what's left of the unifying element of modern science. Well, there is an element here that, you know, this is, there are, not necessarily this brings back to draw as well. Modern science does not have, because modernity in the way it dealt with science, although some people then make, make that move in post If, you know, Marx, Nietzsche, Freud were part of modernity in terms of the thinking uh, that was going on as far as I understand it. So there has been a contestation about, there is something in the disenchantment in modernity that actually brings away also a kind of, concern around not having necessarily an established, toxic, uh, unifying element of modern science. 
I mean, the field of science, I think in that sense, what remains of the modern science is a localized form of science that works around a certain autonomies of the field that you can study and that develop. But I think the controversial element around truth, and that's a concern that runs through what I'm concerned with as well, that if truth becomes the core stake in this, and there is an element about we actually want fixed criteria, very clear structures around which we can claim a truth, a particular truth, which is very different from actually arguing within very specific kinds of, for example, scientific debates that are taking place about whether it's modeling, whether it's whether a particular, you know, understanding of a certain issue, different conflicting understandings of issue. When you actually start thinking about this element, you can't just go back to for a nostalgia for a unifying modern science because that would run against a whole lot of issues which seem to they are very present in our field at the moment as well, where you actually have an acceptance that knowledge means different things. And not necessarily in different locales, but in different times, in different places. So you have actually to work around different conditions. Otherwise, you are actually coming back to the imposition of a distinctive form of knowledge and you don't remain it open uh, to it. And that's, for example, there are books. I mean, there's a book by, let me see if I wrote his name down, by Nicolas Adel on anthropology, the savoir, for example, there are other ones, you know, where you actually show that what times this knowledge is varied and diverse. And therefore, you know, going back for a nostalgia, for a unifying uh, articulation, a strict articulation of modern science would be actually quite a dogmatic move. Does that mean they're only local? No, that is not local because the local has a very big disadvantage. Well, it actually assumes that that runs really against the Timor-Satine, as in my understanding, of the trans-epistemic and the transversal element in which connections are made uh, across. That uh, local seems to understand that people, that entities live almost not, not just on an island, they live in separate worlds, basically. Uh, in which you can, well, actually, you know, there's a lot of interconnection and traversing going on as well uh, between worlds. And of course, doing international politics, we were, I would be particularly interesting in actually that there is no kind of purity, but there is all this mingling and moving in and between. And therefore, being interested in that, these different forms of knowledge and how knowledge is actually done, I wouldn't localize them, you know, I would actually see how they are trans, how they're transversal, how they run into one another and so on, uh, and bring them into the debate. So rather than for a unifying element of uh, knowledge. And that's, I think, is what assembling credibility as a term brings, that it allows for this without either localizing or compartmentalizing knowledge, uh, but actually be sensitive to the transversal kind of relations that take place. And therefore, you don't have pure elements that are left. You only have impurity uh, that is socially, politically, economically, culturally, actually constructed through kinds of encounters and so on. Uh, so I hope that answers that element. It doesn't the answer if you actually, if we think the stake is that we need that the autonomy of science itself is under threat uh, and that that is a big stake to retain. Uh, that's a debate to be had uh, different, but I do not think the solution can be uh, to make universalistic kind of claims about what constitutes uh, a valid truth claim uh, under quite specific criteria, because that would undermine all these other developments that are taking place, which are actually much more democratic and are in some sense democratizing knowledge production and scientific knowledge. Then Joao, your questions, they're very big. I don't know whether I should speculate because uh, unless there's no one else has a question. Uh, maybe what I can say, it is true that it is very interesting that truth has become uh, an argument, but as you see, I do that as well. We move from truth, post-truth to fact, post-fact and so on. And they're not exactly the same that's going on. But there is, why truth is coming back is very interesting. I don't, you know, you would have to, to look in more detail about it. In the article, we refer to how within the debates in academia, how we run across this, how what I refer to, they are steeped into the stake around climate change, because there is a question around, uh, you know, the scientific scientific elements and the elements became articulated apparently in terms of truth and actually truth became connected through grounding into facts. But the history of the fact is not the same necessarily as the history of truth. So what constitutes a fact 
is not necessarily the same uh, as what it does. But there is climate change. You, you mentioned all of them. There is the element about the social media that is there. But if you look at social media, uh, that's taken place. I haven't read, written, I haven't written at all about it, but I haven't read so much about it. But when you read around it, social media, of course, it's not the case that in social media there are no claims made. But there is an element of a particular scientific model that actually runs through social media, for example, is that we are not knowledge and deliberate uh, people who deliberate, but we are influential, influenceable. So the whole idea is about a behavioralist kind of notion that we are influential. There's a specific kind of knowledge that's invested in this and that runs through the elections that is there and so on. So you see these elements, but behavioral economics and behavioralism, you know, sits in the social media as well as a practice is not so important uh, about the content what is being said as but the, in terms of how you influence people people are seen as being influential not in deliberation about you know here is the proof here is this the evidencing and so on so it's a different model that is in there that plays a very important role and why one actually rearticulates this in terms of truth is an interesting question yeah or fact uh because it's and, and it's not that anything goes in that model either, you know. You have it's the that what influences goes, and so you have various elements. Why that relates to truth, I don't know. It's complex. I think these things are coming together somehow and are bringing back uh, to. But I would never uh, approach it that way. And that brings me to the way you formulate the question: is that all the provocations and somehow the question about wouldn't we need back through it come from actually looking and as you say yourself from a war model but also from looking at those who are actually operating very much in the political field for example and so on about challenging uh, those who challenge yeah and don't seem to care about truths and facts but that's not of course for the case if you look at the pandemic it's not just you can look at from the people who deny and live in illusions, but there's still also you can equally say there's still a lot of people as well, and there are all kinds of institutional procedures at place in different places in different ways, where one brings in, uh, you know, classical public health science virologists, one brings in economists to look at things, at consequences, and so on. So it's not the case. So there is a problem as well about us looking through the specific element that there is a war going on precisely because we look at the spectacular kind of issues that are at stake and at place, uh, taking place. So in some way, you know, this is the argument, do we read it through the spectacle that is actually positioned and probably rendered by certain groups in society? Or do we actually step back and say, actually, you know, maybe there is a spectacle going on and there is a serious concern with certain developments that are taking place. But if we actually look in more carefully in this decentralized multiple way about what constitutes the problem here, what is being done across the different fields, because if it's assembling credibility, we can't just read it through the political field. You know, you need to read it through scientific fields, societal, cultural issues, and so on, how they actually work into one another. And I think actually you would get, if you rather than focusing on those who are challenging, those who are storming the capital, those who are denying, uh, you know, certain bodies of knowledge, that you actually get a much more dispersed and diverse field where actually there are serious issues at stake, but it's, it doesn't read like you only have two camps and as if the struggle has to be taken place in this big battle, there are all kinds of small issues. And, and elements that are at play. So I really would argue, and that's the argument of assembling credibility, not to go for the war model uh, of things, to analyze and understand what's going on and go for the spectacle, which of course relates also to an understanding of uh, reading through a spectacular political field as a war that's uh, going on. But I actually would like to re read what's going on in a much more decentralized, decentering and multiple way. Uh, which then also makes it very difficult to speculate, right? Because if you want to speculate what's going to happen on public health, this sounds like the social scientist, but in some way that's true, saying, you know, I need to look at this, which is true. I mean, if you want to actually see these complications around 
public health that is going on. You know, there is a comp with the pandemic, some things came into play in very particular ways and very complicated ways that were going on, but there are multiple developments that come together. So, and I, I guess I play out also slightly differently on the institutional context in which you take place. On. So I find it very difficult but the public health, because I don't study public health as a, as a field of research, is going to change. One of the old debates in public health is whether this kind of these pandemic elements are going to actually seriously change somehow the distribution of the, the means that are available for what kind of research, what kind of practices, what kind of, the, of services that are delivered in the future, for example, away from, you know, everyday kind of health issues to the most spectacular kind of issue of the pandemic because that's now seen as threatening you know as being much more threatening that's an old debate around it and so how this will play out we'll have to see how that works um uh, and what is what is taking place we'll see what's going on i expect that things will change will it undermine i don't also don't know the public health knowledge how that works i mean because the way public health is discussed is in various ways at the moment. I don't know how it's in Brazil, but you know, in the UK, it's for example, you have expert committees, there are questions of experts, there is clearly an understanding that the political field is present, there's clearly an understanding that there are economics at play and so on. So you've got, the, even if you look at actors who are involved in shaping the, the public health agenda around the pandemic, there is, a, there is multiple of them. And setting them up as two camps doesn't really work. It might work maybe in certain in the political field sometimes, uh, but I don't think it works in coming to an understanding if you really are interested in what's going to happen to public health uh, and public health knowledge in the future to actually just set up two camps. Even in terms of actors, I think you're going to have to bring in a multiplicity uh, of relations and factors that are, that are happening. And therefore, this is not just a suspicion. You know, but it is actually looking for the social processes that take place. And that's that's what I would argue that we look at. Uh, and that's, you know, no term will actually, I don't claim that assembly credibility will give answer to all, but that's actually the issue that the notion of looking at these issues from an assembling credibility perspective brings, that it would draw your attention to these things rather than actually keeping on focus, which is very tempting. Uh, to do in discussion, I might do that. You know, when we have a discussion over, over, over a pint or a, or over a drink or something at some point uh, as well. But I think analytically, it is more into it, it, the assembling element brings in this more dispersed. It's not necessarily more complicated, but it is different. It's not a model. It's an element where you also have a sensitivity for the reciprocal, the constructive elements that are taking place, the compromises that are being made, rather than always the clash between two, because my big concern is, I'll stop there, because otherwise I'll keep on running, it's getting late here as well, uh, is that if you actually do this by the challenging and we do the binary thing in the way we analyze what is at stake, then we're, then you actually play also politically, if we now take in the terms of politics, you play the political game of those who have an, uh, have an interest or are mobilizing around questioning the experts, the science, uh, the autonomy of science, uh, the, the very fact that there are facts and so on, because you set them up in that way as if it is a war all the time that is going on. Which that means those of us, and that's where I guess the last question comes from, is those of us who want to actually maybe say there is some element to science that we want to retain that should be put on top, or we want some elements of truth claims that are being possible, then you have to start positioning yourself in more radical terms as a unifying camp around maybe what is the one unifying the unifying conditions of knowledge, which has all kinds of difference. And I think assembling credibility allows to come in in various different ways in our own academic field, maybe operate in other fields as well, to come in and see this kind of working uh, in, a, in a dispersed way. And it gives elements for doing smaller contentious controversies and so on in which interventions are happening, compromises are taking place, things are moving around. And it's between these that things will move. It also means nobody is in control. 
Yeah, so you don't have to have an anti-authoritarian understanding of how things change and move about. Sorry, that was long, but there were very difficult and very big questions. Uh, so I hope I gave some replies to this. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks so much. Um, do we have any more questions? No? Okay. Uh, okay, so if we don't have any more questions, I think we can bring this conference to a close. Uh, so I'd like to thank very much Jeff Heismans for uh, his conference today on behalf of the Brazilian IR Association. Uh, this was the second, second general conference of the eighth uh, national meeting of uh, the Ibri taking place this year. And um, thanks all of you for being here today, both the one, the people who were here on Zoom and on YouTube. And I wish all of you a uh, good uh, uh, next two days of meeting, of every meeting. I think next two days, I think it is, right? Yes. Um, and thanks, um, Carolina, for the invitation. Yeah. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, good seeing you all. Bye-bye.